Welcome. This is Unfolding, the show where I unfold creative business minds. My name is Margot Pfann, and now I just want you to sit back and enjoy the show. So, we're back. Today we're talking to Stephen Price, the founder of Stash Media. And I've been following Stash since I actually grew up with Sign, like, what's that, 20 years ago? I admired Stash Media, the work you do, the, the content you create. Steven is probably the person that watched the most motion graphic videos in the world. And I would want to challenge everyone out there, if they think they watched more, contact me and I'll get you in touch with Steven. So, welcome Steven. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm flattered. Thank you. So what did I miss in the in, in the introduction? There was Stash Media, Stash, the Stash oh, Collection. It can be a little confusing. Um, Stash Media is the parent company we publish um, Stash Magazine, which is a, a daily news site about animation, visual effects, motion design. And then the subscriber product is called the Stash Permanent Collection. And that is published six times a year. It's been going for 20 years. And there we're currently just about to publish issue 164. And that that archive contains about 6,500 videos, um, plus behind the scenes and you know exclusive interviews, blah blah blah. I'm not going to sell you that product right now, but it's a unique thing. It's a unique thing on the planet. It's a B2B um, streaming platform. You know, it's like the Netflix for motion designers. Mm -hmm. And as I've seen you, you you granted me access. As I've seen you have a, a beautiful like tags you can. Elect, uh, you can select what you want to look for. You can search for things, which is amazing. And the reason I want to talk to you and why I'm so so grateful for having you on the show is because you not only have seen the most motion graphic videos out there, but you also have like a broad, you have you have a a broad big picture of you on the industry, on the global industry, right? You you don't just know the American market, you you know the whole industry. I try, we try to, for sure. Yes, I think we do. So when, you, when it comes to the global market of motion design, are there trends? Is there, is there something you can predict? Is there something you see that others miss? Um, I don't know if there's is something unique, but... Um, I could certainly uh, put it into words, and that's the the current thing. And it's actually been going for a long time. Uh, it's just continuing to increase. Uh, is the sort of golden age of of three D design as um, powerful three D tools like you know Cinema four D and more recently Houdini combined with great rendering tools. Um, like Redshift and Octane, et cetera. Um, as those get easier to use and cheaper, democratized basically, you have just the most amazing wave of people using that and this resulting um, volume of amazing work that you wouldn't have seen even three years ago. And when I first started seeing this trend, it was maybe seven or eight years ago. And I tried to raise the flag about it in talks that I did, etc. And but at that time, um, you know, a tool like Houdini was still very much um for for very advanced users. It was very powerful, but you needed to be a very advanced user to use it. And since then they have cracked the usability issue. And so now it's it's just one of the most you know, requested software that we see on the Stash Jobs site. So really, Houdini got to the top? Well, I, I don't think it's, I think Cinema 4D is still the most requested 3D yeah. um, software, if you don't consider After Effects, 3D and After Effects to be 3D. Um, I'd say it would be Cinema 4D and then um, Houdini, and then into Maya and 3ds Max and that kind of stuff. So that 
is what creatives love to do. So the so more and more creatives get into the 3D part and the 3D areas. And that obviously brings more content out the, to, to, to all markets, right? Is there also a trend out like with the clients that they request more 3D stuff? Do they want to see more 3D? I think they do because a lot of this stuff is just really beautiful. And so clients start to want it. Um, creatives love to produce it. And I think right now it's in a bit of a, a self-perpetuating cycle. And it's going to cool off at some point when it becomes too, you know, too overused. Mm. But um, right now it's still, it's still, I would say, at its peak. Although you can see some people like um, Man vs. Machine who... You know, one of the one of the one of the first really big um, proponents of this style. Um, they've started to branch out and do uh, much more live action stuff, more stuff beyond just the beautiful three um, D style thing that we're talking about at this moment, which we can qualify as being sort of that magic realism. Um, things look hyper real, but they're surreal at the same time. They're not trying to actually um simulate reality they go beyond reality does that make sense so people like um future deluxe and tendril man versus machine those kind of people like that but there's there's literally hundreds of the studios now literally hundreds and they don't even need to be studios anymore there's like kids coming out of school in south korea that are doing astounding work mm -hmm. you know, as as there's student projects now, and you can't tell. If it was a blind taste test, you wouldn't be able to tell if that was coming from a major studio or from a 17-year-old kid. Well, that's both terrifying and exciting at the same it time. Is, it's exciting. You got to look at it as exciting. So 3D, 3D is, the, I think, is the, the obvious one. Um, beyond that, there is, I would say a stronger than ever movement to studios and individual artists doing their own personal work, which is not new. I mean, people have always done that. They've always wanted to take a break, squeeze things in between client assignments, et cetera, et cetera. But I think um, from our, our point of view, we're seeing more of that. And we're also seeing uh, those projects be more elaborate. So instead of just doing a 10 second thing at Christmas, right, uh, which is kind of cute and whatever, um, we're seeing much more serious attempts at art, right? Oh, and, and so they're commissioning sound design for it and music for it. It's not just a one off throwaway thing. It's, um, they're serious. There's, serious short films. They're, you know, they may only be 30 seconds or 45 seconds long, but they really use it as a way to boost morale in the studio, um, get away from, you know, doing pack shots and the usual pressures of, of, uh, client work and also as an R and D platform, right. To try out new things, even mm -hmm. creatively and technically. So that's really, I mean, we love that. We absolutely love that. That's amazing. So, so client, so studios actually use that as playground to entertain the people, to keep right. keep the staff entertained. Also, they have to make money, so not all the jobs will be well, flagship projects, let's just say. They have right. to well, different different shops value creativity differently. Some of them, um, creative is is everything. That's what they live and die by, and. Others are much more business oriented and they may never do one. What I'm super curious about is because you get so many pitches every day, like everyone wants to be on the next dash issue. How do you select the people that go on your page? Well, it's, um, it's not a, it's not a, in some ways it's simple because I've been doing it a long time. So a lot of it is now by gut. It's by instinct, right? 
But if you break it down, it's a, it's a many layered thing. First of all, it can't be boring, right? Um, and what does that really mean? It's a combination of it needs to be creative. It needs to be um, technically executed well. And it needs to have an emotional Im impact in the end. Yeah. You, if you combine those three things in some manner that equates to feeling something, um, it could be laughter, it could be tearing up, it could be envy, it could be schadenfreude. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's a full spectrum of emotions and feelings that you're trying to conjure. And as long as it has triggers something on that end, it, and on the technical side, it shows a mastery of the tools, right? Now, you're not just, you know, it's not just the latest plugins that you've managed to buy. And then creatively, it needs to be doing something that maybe we haven't seen before. Or if it is an idea that's been done before, it's just doing it really well, pushing it in a new direction. So generally, you look at those three things. We don't really care about the budget. Um, we do care about the studio. If, if it's a studio that um, has a history of doing great work, for instance, mm -hmm. there is value in seeing what that studio is doing late, right? If it's, but in the same way, that's balanced out by um, a piece of work that maybe is not as virtuous, but it's been done by someone brand new or a totally um, new team that you've never heard of from some part of the world that's that's not a media center, mm -hmm. right? You so you 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 balance all these things together. Sometimes there's a great personal story behind it, right? Uh, Sometimes there's a story like um, this. It's a, it's a personal film and it's about the guy's grandfather who used to be an artist in Poland before the Nazis invaded, you know, there's like a ton of ways that a story can be interesting, right? And so that's the advantage of having done it for so long, is that um, a lot of those factors I just sort of absorb by osmosis. And I can very, very quickly make a decision. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes a thing will come in and I write back saying, thank you. You know, because we try to respond to every every submission. And you say, thank you, your your work is now in consideration for Stash and the Stash Permanent Collection. And some of those will go directly um, to the bin because you, you just know it's not for Stash. Um, but other times, you can't wait to post it. You just can't. You literally can't wait to post it. You've already posted three things today. You should really wait till tomorrow so that you're spreading stuff out, right? But no, you have to post it now because you love it. And then there's other times you're just not sure, and it sits in a tab, right, on your browser for sometimes a week. And then you 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 watch it again, and I don't know. And you watch it again, and then at some point maybe that will will go in. So there's no there's no hard and fast rules because in the end I get to say what's in there, and I just try and be I don't I try not to be capricious about it. I try and make it consistent, but also surprising. So that when you come to Stash, you're not going, oh, yeah, it's more of that. Oh, yeah, it's more of that. <laughs> Got it, yeah. Right. So it's it's broadly based, but it's not so broadly based that you don't know what the focus is. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Does personality play a role? Like the personality of the studio or maybe the, the founder even? Absolutely. I. It's really great when people are... Um, not dilettantes, when people are serious about what they do, right? And when they're professional, when they're 
polite when they make submissions that are complete and not just, hey, well, here's my latest work. Hope you love it. And then that's it. Now, some of those will even arrive without a link. Oh, seriously? <laughs> yeah. All right. But now, all you really need to do is go to the submit page and it's it's not complicated. It's not like, you know, you don't need to submit a textbook or an essay. It's very, very simple what we need. Mm. And if you submit those five things, um, give it your full attention for 20 minutes and submit the thing properly, it makes our job so much easier, right? And then I've got everything I need to make that post. So going and making that post is now a 20-minute thing rather than hunting down stuff, blah, 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 all over the place. And trust me, on a busy day, that can be the difference between you getting posted uh. and not getting posted because, you know what? This one is just too much work. Right. And this one that came in at the same time has got everything I need. It's ready to pop. It's everything I need. It's got the video. It's got like maybe a link to images. It's got... Um, a quote from the director that's actually insightful and not just, you know, blowing smoke up the client's butt. It's got credits. It gives you everything that you need. And that makes such a, such a difference. That's, that's one thing that can really tip um, an average product or average project into getting posted. And it's a thing that can keep an above average uh, project not getting posted because it's just too much hassle, right? In the middle of a busy day. And especially if there's a ton of other stuff coming out at the same time. Now, if it's a really slow day or a very slow week, then yeah, we'll go and dig it up and do all the footwork, but just put yourself in the publisher's position for a second, right? Just, just think about what it would take to, to make this post. Am I giving them what they need? And here's an idea. Before you submit something to a site, doesn't have to be ours. Go to the site. Look around the work that they publish and see what they use when they publish it. Right? Just see what they need. It's a slow like assets, you mean like pictures, text, uh, insights. You, tell me more about, about that, the director's insight. Well, the, I, that's a very good question. But the stuff we need, the assets we need, yes. We need the copy. We need. We don't have to have the images. It's great if there's images. We can get those ourselves. Um, video. We don't want to download your video. We we want to embed it from video from Vimeo or from YouTube. Yeah. There's no other way. Yes, we will go through the 20 minute hassle of downloading your video, uploading it to Vimeo, and then you know it's just a hassle. Mm -hmm. It's just more work. Make it less work for the publisher and you will get published more often, not just with us, with any publisher, right? Anyway, that's my rant on that. Well, that's true. It's like making it easy for, for the publisher, for the client. It's kind of the, the number one thing you want to do. And I want to know more about this, the director's insight, because... Sorry, the one? The, the, the insight from the director that you said, like, yeah, just blowing up smoke client's ass. Yeah. Uh, but actually writing something insightful. Correct. So, and I, working with a lot of studio owners, I know, or I, I have a tendency to believe that this is the hardest thing for any creative. What, what, what is insightful for you? Okay. Such it's, a really, it's really straightforward. And I understand that talking about your own work can feel like you're bragging, it can feel, I don't know where to start because this project was so, so huge. There's a lot of, you're right, there's a lot of impediments to to writing about your own work. So there's a couple of ways to get around that. You can have uh, a junior person who has a half a brain and can and, and, and writing skills, some social skills to to do it. You can have your EP do it or a producer do it. Someone who's not... Ex you know, engaged directly in the creative and wasn't buried in this thing for three months and has no chance of being objective, right? That's good. Okay. Yeah. 
That's one way to go about it. And if that's not possible, and or you can combine that with the actual questions we ask are, give us a couple of paragraphs on the creative and the technical problems, challenges that you faced mm. and how you overcame them. Yeah. Right? Just saying this is a project that I've wanted to do forever and we're so proud to do it and we're really proud of the team and the client gave us all sorts of creative freedom. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. What we want to hear is we had four days or four weeks, right? Don't tell me it's a short schedule and move on. How long was the schedule? You don't have to tell me the budget, but if you're going to mention a short schedule, tell me what that schedule was. To give it some meat. Give it some, some reality. And then tell us that, you know, it was motion capture and the files were all screwed up or the client changed his mind halfway through the thing and, and we, we had to shift to live action from all, all CG. These are the real world things that bring a project to life, right? It's all shiny and perfect on the screen, but everybody knows who's been in production at all that that's not the reality. The reality was three months of total trauma and right to get this thing onto the screen. Of course, they're not all trauma. We've all I done great, that, but it's a good analogy. We've all done great smooth projects, but most of the time, fifty percent of it is solving problems. I mean, that's what you do for a living. You solve problems. If you and the better that you are at solving problems, the more clients you have. It's that's what people are hiring you for. So tell us about those problems, those challenges, and how you solve them. It's as simple as that. You don't have to get all deep and personal about it if you don't want to. But that makes it so much more relatable because we can all feel the pain, like Sean's right. schedule, low budget, exactly. micromanaging yeah. clients. You just hit the nail on the head. It's about commonality. You're establishing commonality with other production people. Yeah. And then, oh my God, I had that problem too. It's so great to know that I'm not alone. Well, we're not the only studio you know, that we're in a, a 14 way pitch, right? It's just a really, it's a, it's such an easy and effective and appreciated way um, to talk about your work. It is. And it's like, it's honest. It's, it's, it's not what you said. It's not this, this facade of everyone is happy, but it's like, we went through this, it was a trauma, and we came out the other side, all wiser. Um, I love that. You can't be scared to talk about the problems. I mean, nobody believes you that everything went swimmingly. One in 20 projects go really, really, really smoothly, right? I never had one. I never experienced Ever? that. Yes. <laughs> well, there were some nice moments in every project, but it's not like the, like every project, like, the bigger the budget gets, the more problems, the more stakeholders, the more problems, the more yeah. discussions, the less work you actually do. Um, Steven, I remember from our warm up call that um, when I asked you about what's important to get on stash, um, you mentioned this, particularly mentioned the feeling part. Right. What does it mean to bring in some feelings, some emotions? What does that mean? Like, why, why do you look for that? Um, well, that's a good question. The why do I look for it is because over the, the course of doing this for a long time, it began to be, um, become very apparent to me that the, first of all, the creative, I mean, sorry, the technical side is is almost a given, right? If you hire a photographer, you assume the picture will be in focus, right? So in some ways, the technical is assumed. Not that we can't acknowledge amazing technical or, or um, when technical gets pushed, right? And there's innovative technical things going on. But a lot of times the technical is assumed. So then you're looking at creative and that's obviously important, but it's not always the thing that, that 
that is making me choose the work. And the more I thought about it, it, it just became very obvious. It's because I laughed. It's because I, I teared up. Mm. It's because when I watched that, that, that video, wow, I, I really want that couch. I really want it. <laughs> I want to buy that lamp, yeah. right? That's, it's covetousness, right? It's greed. It's envy. Those are real feelings. Those are real emotions. Um, and so the more I thought about it, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to, to throw in that those emotions, actually, what he just described is that emotions trigger a purchase. I call to it. It's not, it's not that simple, but I'll, I'll explain that chain to you in a second. So, um, I was doing these, uh, talks at Promax BDA for a, a bunch of years and by the, you know, you just, the state of design keynote, right? And that was fun because you get to show cool work and stuff. But by the third year, I was thinking, I, I got nothing left to say. I got, you know, I got nothing. What am I going to do? This is the third year. What am I going to do? And I can't just show cool work because that just feels so empty. And so I started to think seriously about this, this emotional quotient that I was um, believing in. So I started to do some research and I researched the physio physiology and the psychology and how those two things um, meet in terms of how our brain and body works together. Right. And there's a four step process. There's the outside stimulus, which in our case is an ad, a music video, a movie trailer, title sequence, doesn't matter. It's the design. And those, that stimulus hits each of us uh, and creates an emotion. That emotion creates a feeling. And that feeling will trigger an action. So it's a four-step process. And it's not its not uh, a conspiracy theory. I mean, this is just backed up by the data and, and tons of research. How your brain and your body work together. Now, the difference between an emotion and a, a feeling is an emotion is very primal. It's just, um, it's the first thing you feel in your gut, in the back of your lizard brain. Um, and a feeling is your personal interpretation, your subjective interpretation of that emotion. So as an example, go ahead. It's the interpretation of that emotion, but felt in the body. Sorry? The interpretation of the emotion felt through the body. Well, well, your feeling. So it's, it's basically yeah. in, in your being. Yeah. So as an example, um, if you, if the, um, the stimulus is danger, Right, you're walking on. You're walking in a forest path, and you see a bear on the on the on the path. My reaction, my emotion, is fear. The first thing I feel is fear, right? And my feeling about that fear is I feel scared, and my my action is I run away. Right, very simple chain of events. But here's where things diverge. The woman walking next to me sees the same bear, the same stimulus, the same danger. But she has, she's walking with her child, hand in hand with a child. So her immediate reaction, her emotion is anger. Okay? I'm running away, but she feels anger. Don't screw with me and my family. And her instinct, her feeling, her interpretation of that anger is to fight back. Now, probably not the smart thing to do with the bear, but I'm just trying to demonstrate the differences from the same the same stimulus to very, very divergent paths. She went from anger to feeling protective to fighting back. I went from fear to scared to running away, right? So this is just a demonstration of, in, in our world, in the design world, your ad, your piece of design, is the stimulus. You have to go through emotion and feeling before your customer, your viewer, whoever, your target audience, is going to have an action. You cannot assume that because you design something beautiful, people will go buy your thing. It's just not how it works. You have to cause an emotion, 
they will interpret that emotion. And if you've done your job right, they will have the correct action. Not, and not necessarily buy your product, but they'll have a positive action. And that could be sharing your ad. It could be um, just saving that, like bookmarking that, that thing for later. It could be going and Googling that product, or it could be going right on the, the website, clicking the button and buying it right there, right? You can think of it like, like a, my favorite metaphor for it is a, it is a trick pool shot. You only get to touch the, the cue ball, right? You only get to touch the white ball. But to hit, to sink the eight ball, that eight ball is three balls away. You have to hit the emotion ball and the feeling ball to sink the eight ball. That is a very, very hard pool shot. And that also means you got to understand the audience because the emotions, the feelings depends on who you speak to. Right. Um, and you can't just throw out a nice animation that you like. You kind of, you kind of need to adapt to adapt. It's going to be more efficient. It's got to be more efficient if you do. And that's what, why so many uh, agencies and, and big brands do research. They're, they're trying to simplify. They're trying to standardize that chain. Right, it's not, it's not foolproof, and sometimes you can just kick out a beautiful image by instinct, and people will buy it because by a happenstance and accident, you did line up that chain, and it worked. But yeah. to be oblivious of that chain and how it actually functions with your brain and your body, according to science and research, you're just, you know, you're just the designer arty guy or girl. It's, it's, it's fine. I'm not telling you to go and do this. I'm not telling you to lock yourself down and suck the life out of your work, trying to read everybody's mind. I'm just saying you need to be aware that this is how things work, right? And so the more you concentrate and learn about um, feelings and emotions and the full spectrum of them, the better a designer you're going to be, I believe. I believe so too. And I know that the client kind of expects this. They don't say that because they can't necessarily articulate it in the way you just did. The clients want more than just things looking nice and beautiful, right? They want they want a return of investment for what they give you. And what I love about what you just said, if if you would tell this to a client, the client would immediately give you more money because he trusts you more, because he now understands you know what you're doing. And there's a higher probability of actually getting a good return of investment. So I love that that, that this is a true insight. So if, if clients, if, if people would talk like that, um, they wouldn't have problems to sell their work. Some clients, I think, would appreciate it. I've I've dealt with clients who don't want to hear anything like that. Okay, like they some clients are just like sociopathic businessmen, and they they just want a logo. They don't want to hear any design talk. Yeah. Stop, stop, stop talking design talk. Just show me the logo, right? I've had clients like that, and that's fine too. But underneath, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that his brain works the same way everybody else's does. Good point. Very good point. That's true. Even though he doesn't admit it and doesn't want to hear it, yeah. he's still being triggered by the same things, right. opposed to the same emotions, the same feelings. Love it. So no matter what the client says, it pays off. He's going to have a feeling based on that. On when he sees the logo, he will have a feeling. Yeah. When he sees the logo, he has a feeling. That's good. Yeah. But the um, the the great thing about this is, um, like I say, I, I'm I'm not trying to get people to overanalyze everything, and we have a, a great tool already that has been around for a hundred thousand years or more to to solve a lot of this, and that's called narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Or myth or fiction. Um, and one of the things that, that narrative does, stories do, are craft or sculpt these emotions, right? You build a story to create emotions, and then there's, there's the resolution of the story. And everybody now likes to say that, you know, we, we're telling brand stories, um, which is easy to make fun of. And I certainly have 
in my time that everybody's a storyteller. But, you know, in the end, it's actually fantastic that people that don't, they don't see themselves. So they don't say, oh, I'm an animator. I'm a designer. They, they say I'm a storyteller, which can seem pretentious, right? But it's, what's great about it is it means that they're aware yes. of the power of story, yes. right? The power of narrative. And that is a step forward, a big, big step forward from just being, you know, an egotistical animator. I make things move. What do you need me to move? I'll move it. Where do you need me to move it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Storyteller is actually a, a big leap. That's true. Uh, not a final leap, but it's a big step forward. Yes. So I'm going to bring this back around in a circle here. One of the, in that, that same talk, I made the point that the most uh, important part of narrative, the most efficient way to tell stories was to use characters. Right? And... Um, that's not a big uh, revelation uh, for a lot of people, but it's important to understand why, I think. And the reason that characters are so efficient and effective in telling stories is because what psychologists call the theory of mind. And that's our ability to put ourselves in other people's shoes, to think, imagine what other people are thinking. And... The great thing about that is you got six seconds to, to, you know, be, then people can skip your ad. Characters arrive with a built-in backstory and a built-in uh, sense of what they're going to do just by the look of them. Because we're so used to seeing characters, analyzing characters, as soon as we see a character we fill in their backstory a little bit at least and we think about what they're going to do it's just how our brain works so without before the characters even said anything or you've or you've told anybody anything about this character they've already formed an opinion and a even a mini timeline of that character right and that's one of the reasons it's there's no other element in design that's that efficient in terms of telling a story. That's true because it comes with the baggage, with the history, yeah. all the narratives. You can even create a conflict within six six seconds by placing specific characters next to each other. Mm -hmm. Or within the same character. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So you know, here's the thing that I was thinking about not very long ago. You, given that whole, whole cool diatribe that I just went through and how powerful characters are for telling stories, Put that right against what I said at the beginning of this. What's the biggest trend right now? It's abstract 3D design. <laughs> right? There is like 99% of that really cool work right now does not have characters in it. That's yeah, good. Good point. Right? So how do we how do we bring those two together? There's a couple ways, but we don't have time to go into it in a heavy, heavy way. So you can just put it down to this. It's not impossible to tell stories and make connections without characters, right? You don't have to have, them. and that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying they're the most efficient, they're the most, they're the easiest, they're um, the most e efficient ways, way to tell story. Yeah. Now, the fact that one of the reasons I love this whole movement in 3D so much is that they are causing emotions on a massive scale. In terms of design, you know, massive, I mean, undeniable that people really, really love this style. And there's no characters. It's purely abstract. And that is, I don't think we've, we've ever seen that before. Ever. Right? You think back, just to the traditional art world, when, it, when abstraction started to... Um, come to bear at the very beginning of the of the 20th century right and then it got up into the 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 mid-century when it sort of hit its peak and um arguably and it just you know it never had the impact that figurative art had and i'm my i know my my parents who grew up in that time they thought it was all a con my dad thought picasso 
was the biggest con artist of all time, right? Because he was drawing like a child and, and people were just like paying millions and millions of dollars for it, right? So it's kind of given in, in that, with that metaphor, the more abstract you get, the more elitist things you usually get, right? In the art world. Yeah. But here, we're seeing kind of the exact opposite in that really, really abstracted forms, although they look shiny and real, there's no characters. There's just often really abstract geometry doing really cool things. And it has a real emotional impact. And that's, that's a, I just don't know any other admin degree that that has happened. Is that because the animation creates the, the character, so to speak? I mean, sometimes there's, sometimes the product is the character, right? Or the, the, or the rectangle is the character, whatever. Or the, the motion, it's, it's, it has, um, it can be cute. It can be yeah. bouncy. It can be fun. There can be uh, some emotion implied in, in the motion as it were. But I think, I think part of the secret here, the secret secret of this tell work me. Tell me. Is, is, and all the audio design guys are going to love me for this, but I think audio, the music and sound design has taken on a huge new importance and is a major reason why this work is so popular. Because if you try, try watching it without the audio and it's still visually amazing, but it doesn't have the emotional impact that it does when when the music is applied. And of course, that is universal. Music, this is the first time music and audio design or sound design is important. I'm just saying with this type of work especially, the importance of music and sound design has, has been amplified, so to speak. Has been given a, a broader platform i'd say yes that's true and i think there's more there's more teamwork i think from what i understand you know interviewing these people and um having seen press releases and um submissions from so many of them they consider um the partnership with the the sound design and musician they consider them a real creative partner um, often from the very beginning of the project it's not like when I was in the commercial world where audio was always pushed way to the end of the schedule. Mm. And they were not a total afterthought, but they were really most of the time not part of the creative process. And, and that seems to have changed a lot, which is fantastic. Right? I mean, the way it should always have been. Work becomes more intuitive, more fluent. And yes, I agree. Like when I... Like sound design, they, they always complain the sound designers because they always were last to get anything. Yeah. Um, everybody else's schedule expanded yeah. and things got delayed. Well, the delivery date didn't change. No. Nope. So the last guy. One night, last night, do it. It's probably magic. It. Do something. Anyway, I think that's, and we always yeah. are very, we try to be vigilant about always crediting the audio people as much as we can yeah. um, because it's just they're just so important yes they are and they it, they need to be appreciated much much more that's so true Stephen one question um, what like over the last 20 years are there some stories some narratives some movies that still stuck with you that's that stuck with you, that still stick with you. Things that we've covered, you mean? Yeah, something something that stands out in a personal way, maybe, or something that that you remember from ages ago, or maybe well, just last week. I remember. Um, I should have had some of those prepared, probably, but I would say, I would say there was times when you really felt you were seeing the beginning of something new. And uh, the first one that comes to mind is very, very early uh, when PSYOP was still very young 
and you know it was four partners in a in an abandoned bar in in the lower east side of new york um and the work that started to come out of there felt very important it felt like it was creatively fresh but very very confident um it still paid it wasn't just about style although it had reams of style and it was trend setting in that it was starting styles they were very very um they adhered to story and knew that the emotional quotient needed to be there mm -hmm. and those early years of PSYOP, it was, it was very hard for us not to put PSYOP on the cover of, you know, month after month after month, Man. right? I had to just yes. put other people on the cover because they were so dominant, yes. right? That, that, um, that sticks out. I would also say I think there's longer narratives, longer story arcs that are important, like... Um, for instance, um, a, a rival to to Sia, which is Buck. Um, the fact that they've been around just as long, and have managed to stay as vibrant and as fresh, as trend setting, um, is mind boggling. Because if you run your own company, you know it's really really hard, not only to be in business that long, but to foster a creative atmosphere where everybody wants to work. There's, there's no duds. I don't see any projects that come out of that studio that you just think, wow, they're slipping. No, they don't. They, you know, I seriously don't and know. That's, that's an important thing. And they're, they're not the only one. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of angle studios that, that do a fantastic job. Yeah. Like studio, AKA passion pictures. For instance, these people have been around for a really long time, doing excellent work for a long time. So I think those those really long narratives uh, are underappreciated, personally. You mean the long narratives of the studio themselves? Of the, of the studio and, and keeping that level of, of yeah. quality. Yeah, man, I, I would count Man vs. Machine in there too. They have been around for ages too. Yeah, there are actually a few. But... And then that's actually a great point is like back in the days, 10, 15, 20 years ago, there weren't as many great studios out there as they are, as they are today. Right. How, how, like, so as a newcomer, how can you stand out in today's world where you have so much more competition? And on top, you also have the legacy companies that you have to stand out against. Right. So what what strategies, what tactics could work here? Um, well, there's a couple of couple of things there. I mean, new new talent comes along all the time. I'll give you an, another example of um, someone I find ex a breakout star, if you want. His name is So My Son. Hope I'm pronouncing his first name properly, um, but he's a a young Chinese director designer, and he's been on the cover of Stash. Everything that he does is I don't want to use the word visionary is a little strong, but he's not playing by anybody else's rules, right? He's primarily a three D guy came up through 3d very strong sense of design um but strong sense of story character rendering um and it's all really cool it's really really cool and um I mean, he's not the only one obviously but we can't talk about everybody <laughs> so how does he how does he make an impact he they they start small they start with regional work they and a lot of guys in the east make their name doing phone commercials right doing beautiful 3d phone commercials and 
he did the same thing, but he brought a, a new level of drama, a new level of narrative, a new level of cinema. Um, what would you call it? Just a cinematic quality to these commercials that you just didn't see anywhere else. And then he did some title sequences for um, uh, design, you know, design conferences, et cetera, et cetera. So that's that's the actual work, like doing finding ways to do fresh work for small amounts of money and then getting the word out about that. But I'll tell you, there's one thing that's really uh, common between great the greatest people that, that we're fans of just from work wise. And then when you get to know them, they're actually super professional but also very friendly and no ego, super helpful, right? And so with Samai in this last, um, this last issue, we have a piece from him. And I just asked him, could you send, you know, a couple of paragraphs, just what I said before about the, the challenges. And, you know, he writes back right away and gives you way more than you need. And just tons of insight, well-written, spell checked and just so easy to deal with right and all the 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 greatest talents like that i've found patrick clare is another one you know patrick clare from no you know Aust australian guy and he was the king of um you know tv sequences for tv title sequences for a long time won several emmys and he's the same way. He's just so easy to deal with, so friendly, so responsive, um, so forthcoming with the stuff that we want to pass on, right? And always, always grateful for the coverage, et cetera. So that's why we, or I'm sorry, I'm digressing here. We're talking about how to make yourself stand out. That is one way to make yourself stand out, not just with publishers, but with clients, mm -hmm. they don't want to deal with prima donnas, really, unless you're already a superstar and you can get away with that. And in the end, anyone that pitches something to you, they want they want you, right? they want your platform, they want to have something from you. They're selling something. It's not like you're waiting for the next big thing to come because you have plenty of people, plenty of things to cover. That's true. Every single day, so... I think this this friendliness, this responsiveness, this this no ego, um, I think that goes a long way uh, when you want to have something from someone, right? If you want to get something, there's confidence and there's insight, but it's it's not ego based, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that's a uh, a couple of things. There's also don't submit. If you're we're talking about publishers or we're talking about your reel where you're submitting it to clients, don't put everything on there. If you if you need to do work that pays the bills, that's not that's not great. But you need to pay the bills. We've all been there. You do work that just not that great. Don't submit it. Don't put it on the reel. If you need to fill up the reel do personal stuff that looks real, mm. right? But don't garbage up your reel with garbage just because you did it, right? Nobody wants to be associated with that. They want to see, for clients, your reel is aspirational, right? Think of it that way. They want to aspire to have you work for them is one way to think about it. Mm -hmm. So make your reel aspirational. That's a good point. Yeah, it's um, it, I mean, I was I was, you know, the producer and EP at several studios. Of those, uh, that was my job, and we cut, we cut dozens of reels, custom for people, so that it was for them. We were trying to connect to them. We didn't want to give them the generic low. Oh, so, so you made specific reels for clients. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. We had a we had, we just set up a pipeline that made it really easy to recut the reel really fast. Now we didn't do it for everybody. And after you've got, you know, five, six, seven reels, 
that are that got different feels to them and different emphasis, well, you know, chances are one of those seven is going to work. Yeah. Uh, go and then if it's something big and special, you might do something, but you keep them up to date and you make people feel that it's a pitch and it, it connects with them. So it's to do that, what do you have to do? Like when you submit your work to a site, you go and you research that site. Don't send your visual effects behind the scenes to somebody who's covering branding and design. Mm. It's a waste of your time and a waste of their time. Don't send your fully live action um, music video to me. I don't come with fully live action stuff, right? Now, if it's live action, it's got some visual effects, some design, some motion design in it, absolutely. But don't waste my time and don't waste their time. Research your the publications you're submitting to the same way you would research the client, right? What have they done before? What do they like? What directors have they used before? What studios have they used before? Et cetera, et cetera. Common and sense. People. And it's the audience actually like, the, the audience of the platform of the publishers that our audience I think that's a big point too like you want yeah you want to submit your work to an audience that actually appreciates it and, and that actually can that, that that knows what to do with it that understands right. it good right. point well if you if you're if you have a, a list of 30 publications that you submit to and you keep submitting everything to all 30 um you know, publications, it, it doesn't make any sense because the people on the other end get the idea that you have no idea what they do. You're just sending garbage to them. You're just sending everything, hoping something will stick. That's not how things stick. Oh, hoping something will stick and spamming people, that's true. And in the end, they probably, well, not to listen to you anymore anyway. Good point. And so when how you just need to be a little bit more mindful of it. It's not like there's a thousand places to submit your work, right? Just be a little more mindful of it and you will have greater success. Mm -hmm. Right? Now you can say there's people that submit to me and you can feel their growing frustration because things aren't getting aren't getting, you know, over the course of a year they submit six things and nothing's getting published. You can feel the brittleness and the tension on the other end as their emails get less and less patient. And dude, you've never, I don't think you've ever been to my site. I can that's, tell. Okay. I that's a question you have. That's a question you have. If when you, you were there, yeah. you weren't, you weren't actually watching and listening. Yeah. You know, it's just, anyway, it's, it's just like anything else in life. You want to sell something to somebody. Take your time. Do a little make research. It, make an effort. Yeah. yeah. Stephen. Eddie. More ranting. <laughs> I love it. No, because the, the, those are the things people need to hear. Those are those are seem to be obvious, those ideas, those those instructions. But you're right, we're not paying enough attention on how we pitch, on the thoughtfulness, on, on the easiness. Of rare things we want to bring over. Um, um, so I understand, I understand that that you know submitting your stuff is the very end of the process, and you're you're tired from doing the project. You're exhausted, right? Now I just want someone to recognize this stuff. God damn it! Just publish my work. Well, I understand that. I was in production, right? I understand that, but. That's not how we see the world. And that's not how the world sees your work. And that's a good reality check. I love it. Take, take a day, take a week. Take your time. Relax. Write, write, write your press release and then put it aside and come back the next day and write it again. Mm. And take your time. Just do it. Give it some effort. It doesn't have to be super professional. You don't have to be a PR person. Most of the time, the stuff that comes from PR people is very well organized. It's just full of so much fluff that it's really hard to use. And we'll, we'll get a press release, you know, that's this long, and we'll use 
the quotes. And that's because the rest of it is really blowing smoke up the client's butt and nobody can use that. Nobody can use that. The only place that stuff gets published is on sites where you publish yourself, right? Which have their uses. I'm not putting them down. But nobody wants to read that. Nobody's going to read through that amount of stuff. They want to get to the meat, right? And for us, the meat is let's talk to the, the, the people who created this thing. Mm -hmm. What are their thoughts? What were their challenges? How did they solve this? How did they feel? Yeah. yeah. Who is on the next stash issue on the cover of the next stash? Um, the one that's, that's just coming out this week is a music video out of France. And I can't remember the band, but the studio is called Pencil TV. And it's just, it's a lovely, lovely, lovely piece of work. It's 3D, but it's very um, soft and atmospheric. It's full of metaphors, like visual metaphors, like you might have found in old editorial illustrations. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, it's really, it's really lovely. And it happened to have a great frame in it that made a good cover, right? Um, the two things have to line up. But there's a ton of cool stuff on this one. I think it's one of our strongest, really. It's just, I think it's just because there's, the back to the democratization thing we're talking about, there's just more and more studios doing world-class work. Like literally there isn't, I don't know, three times a week we discover a new studio that's doing world-class work, literally world-class work that we've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. It's our job to hear of these studios, right? And it's literally three times a week that, and it's not, it's not all publishable, But going, who? Who is this? Where? Where are they from? Another studio from Barcelona. Okay. All right. How many studios can there be? <laughs> That's <laughs> Barcelona. That's true. Yeah, it's true. It's like it's just like when I go out there and, and look for clients or talk to people. I don't. I, I think creatives don't realize how many how much competition there actually is. How much world class competition they have these days it it's amazing it, it's scary but it's also exciting you can learn so much also means that the the market the, the whole the whole cake uh, gains in size so there's a lot more screens to fill and there's a lot more a lot more screens to fill. Ah, yes but and one of the the interesting things about that is the quality of work um you know it wasn't a, a whole long time ago when an explainer video was like uh no thanks we don't do explainer videos yes i remember right. that yeah i mean I, i i've never done one when i was in production and if someone had asked us to the i mean it would be like doing a slideshow it would be like no no thanks but now or or just product reveals right that used to be relegated to some junior guy or girl and who just learned 3D and, okay, yeah, you know, make it spin around a couple times and uh, see if you can make the lighting kind of, you know, good. And now some of the best animation that we see in the design motion world is exactly that. They're explainers and they're, they're product reveals, right? So the quality... Like you, got the breadth of work is expanding because the number of screens has expanded exponentially. Yes. Now the quality is trickling down from like not just big budget ads, right? But it's trickling down to the smaller budget things. So our expectations of of ex explainer videos, and then I'm not talking about you know the whiteboard um, commoditized stuff, but stuff that still has a script and a, and a storyboard and is a story to tell really is that that quality is trickling down through everything. Yeah. And it's really heartening to see. It's just lovely to see that level of quality being applied to almost anything. Right. Yeah. In the motion design world, I'm talking about obviously. 
I love to do product launches when I was still in the game. Um, that was the easiest job because you, you actually had the most creative freedom doing that because no one cared. Mm-hmm. And that was that was always a fun job. And you, you could play so much with animation. You could do crazy things. It wasn't that, yeah. Usually you, had, you just had a creative director to convince and not like the every stakeholder. Right, right. So, yeah. yeah. Well, there's another interesting part to that in that um, it has to do with the democratization aspect and that tools are getting easier to use. You can, and, you know, computers are more powerful, et cetera. You see, you can generate a lot more footage and a lot of really interesting footage. Mm-hmm. And especially in this, the 3D world that we've been talking about, um, there's a project coming up in this next issue um, where they, we always ask them what the schedule was. Right as part of the part of the questions, and this one was three months, and the first month and a half of this project was spent on pure R and D. Nice, a month and a half out of a three month project was purely playing around, trying to to generate imagery that no one else has ever seen before. Right, and so I'm not sure how much. You know, actual linear footage they they generated in that time. But let's just say two hours. Let's just say there was two hours worth of stuff, tests and retests and version A, B, C, and D, right? Generated ad nauseum, filling up discs, and then you got to fill thirty seconds. The spot is thirty seconds long. You generated two hours. So then the real job becomes curatorial. Right? How am I going to choose 30 seconds out of those two hours that will electrify people? And that comes down to choosing the shots, editing them. That's pure curatorial. And of course, combined with the audio that we've already talked about. Right? That's a very exciting place to be in design. Thank because you. if you if you came up in, in animation when I did, there was no extra frames generated. Yeah, no meat. You've generated, there might have been three or four frames on the end of a scene, and that was it, right? Because it was expensive and it was hard to do. Now, there you can generate totally unprecedented imagery like it's live action, like it's just flowing out of your team. And then the creative director is honing it, honing it, honing it, right? And then finally packaging and editing and it's it's just like a golden a golden time for design i'm really happy to be a part of it you know it's just a it's the best job in the world best job i ever had that's a great point uh, a great statement and i'm sorry to cut this short but we are at the one hour mark Okay, and I'd love to talk you to you again. Uh, it has been insightful. It has been pleas- It has been pleasant. Um, one more question. One last question. What's like a message that you want to leave the audience with? This audience, or like the the worldwide stash audience? Ideally, the same. Okay, Maybe the same. Good point. Good point. I don't know. I guess you'd got to got to wrap all this up. Um, really depends where you are in your career, where you are in the production pipeline. But I think if you approach um, this job with with a sense of purpose, you take it seriously. But you also take it with a sense of delight at the same time, then that's going to show through. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's like professional and light at the same time. So you're dead serious about what you do, but you also know that what you do is not brain surgery. Right? This is design. We're selling stuff. We're making things look good. So let's not get our knickers in 
a twist. But also, remember, this can be super, super crucial for a client, right? So if you can balance those two things, I think you're going to be happy and you will, there's, there's a ton of joy to be found in the industry, but you need to realize that there's a, all these balls that need to be juggled, right? The creative, the technical, the emotional that we just talked about, but also your own place in it where you're very professional, but can see that it can be fun. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Playful and but all serious. Yep. Like those people that I'm talking about that I, I respect so much when they're being friendly, it's they can they can snap instantly from friendly to professional. Mm. Two sides of them are are there in parallel. They just it's just like layers in Photoshop. They just bring one to they just bring one to the front, but can immediately switch them. Mm-hmm. Right? Because they're the the two sides of them are are operating in parallel. That's a great idea yeah. because you don't have to mix them, you can actually prioritize them one right. at a time. And bring one out bring one out when it's when it's necessary and have total mastery of both and not think that because I'm professional, I can't be fun and friendly. And to think that just because I'm fun and friendly doesn't mean I can't be business-like and professional. Those mm-hmm. two things are two halves of the same construct, right? You need to have them, you need to have them both, I believe. So do I. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, it was lovely having you on the show and I hope we can do this again because there's obviously a lot more to discuss when it comes to motion design, the creative industry and yeah, I'm looking forward to having you on the show in the future again and thanks for your time today. Well, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Flattered to be here. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. My name is Mark Fun and hope to see you all again on our next show where we unfold creative business minds.